So if you can, please say and spell your name. Sure. And tell us where, where we are. All right. Well, my name is Rachel Hudson, and that is R-A-C-H-A-E-L Hudson, H-U-D-S-O-N. And I am the owner and head brewer for Pilot Brewing Company here in Charlotte, North Carolina. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us. Today is Wednesday, June 13th. We are here in Charlotte talking to Rachel. Um, and this is part of the Wellcrafted NC project. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Where, where are you from? I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, um, where I started brewing also. But before I was a brewer, I was just big into the beer, craft beer world, working at a beer bar. Um, so I spent about a couple years working at a beer bar, really learning about beer because that's what I had to do for my job. But eventually developing a passion for you know drinking it and exploring it and learning more in depth about it. Um, man, I spent five years at that first company learning. I mean, I think I was 19 when I started, and so I at, throughout the course of that time, you know, moved into some beer buyer management positions and really got to be more immersed in the beer side. Um, um, learning about it and teaching other people about it versus just serving it. So I spent uh, maybe about a year or so after that doing some other bartending jobs focused around craft beer. And then a, a brewery called Hardywood Park in Richmond, Virginia opened up uh, about maybe seven years ago now, maybe seven and a half. And the, I just got super lucky. I didn't know. I knew a lot about beer. I could tell you a little bit about brewing. Sorry, turn that off but I had never brewed before. And um, they had a really big system and one employee, and I think they realized that wasn't gonna really work out. They needed more help, and I got lucky. I got to go volunteer for a day, and they just kept letting me come back, and it worked out. And two and a half years later, you know, I, I'd been spending there. I learned a lot about brewing and um, cleaning, cleaning, like more of like what to do in the brewery versus like the science and everything behind mm -hmm. it. I didn't home brew, you know, I brewed on their 20 barrel system and that was my learning experience. They had a little small system too, but I never had like the stuff at home to do it myself. But um, gosh, two and a half years there and then I kind of I started to apply for other places because, you know, I grew up in Richmond and I was like, don't want to stay here forever, don't want to leave. So I ended up going to Left Hand Brewery in Colorado. and. Um, my husband now, but my boyfriend, new new boyfriend at the time, <laughs> he is a pilot, and hence pilot brewing. But uh, he, I got, I was lucky where I just felt like I could go, and he came, and um, we spent a year there where he was commuting from Philly to Colorado to to live and work, and you know became old kind of quick. So we eventually, although Colorado was fantastic, we got the chance to for him to move to Charlotte be based here and not have to commute to work. So that ultimately brought us here, but it was great learning them. Um, Left Hand's a huge brewery, 60 barrel brew house and 500 barrel fermenters. And there's definitely bigger breweries, but it's a huge brewery to learn on. And it was fantastic. I mean, I learned lots of how to, <coughs> excuse me, handle the bigger tanks and the centrifuging and filtering and lab science behind it. Mm -hmm. So my you know education definitely expanded science wise I would say at that brewery, right? And we ultimately came here like I said for my husband's job where I courted it Noda literally, yeah. <laughs> and I had really lucky really good timing they um, they were actually opened the same month and year as Hardywood my first brewery so very similar same size system almost and they were expanding to their sixty barrel their new facility right when I had just come from working on that type of system. So it was very good timing. And they were great and spent a couple years, almost two years there until we you know, decided it would be a good time to quit so I could focus solely on pilot. But I would say about six months into working at Noda, we knew we would open something and start working on that at home, you know, to yeah. develop that business plan and, and get it going. It, it's been about two and a half years so far since we sat down and said, okay, we're gonna do this. So what was it that ultimately led you to say? Oh, you just got it. It's just so satisfying and do it for yourself. I mean, brewing what you wanna brew. You know, I have, all these breweries are so big. They distribute bottle, can, kegs, sales reps. It's such a game. It's such a, like, a beast that constantly needs to be tamed. And, you know, left hand 
it was fun, but you know, it was 24 seven brewing and we had overnight shifts and working 10 p.m. to 8 a.m. in negative 17 degree weather wasn't my dream. <laughs> Although fun, and, you know, and every, you, you take the good with the bad, living out there was great too. But, um, you know, coming to Noda, I got away from that overnight part, which was great, and it's a lot warmer here. But um, you just, you, it's, it's a rock star job, it's not rock star pay, and you know, things, you get older and you're like, maybe I want to have a family and what happens to my job when I get pregnant? It's not like I can keep slugging stuff up to like week before or anything, you know? So there's stuff like that you just start to think about. It's just mm -hmm. like, I had so much more fun just making a small batch and, you know, all, when all you make is milk stout or hop, chop and roll, you so, it's got to be the same beer every single time. You know, the, the focus is on quality at a, and on a big level and putting beers in a can or bottle and keeping the oxygen level down and making sure the yeast is that and you know, doing what you're supposed to be doing which is your job and it's great and you, you, you forget that a lot of people would kill to do that job you know but once you're in it you start to like what can I what's next what can I do what's more I, you know I want to I want to do this for me I want to have fun I want to be able to have a kid and not worry about what happens to my job. I want, you know, I wanted to make more money doing it. And, and I ultimately wanted to be able to provide a couple of good jobs for people. I knew I wasn't going to like, what, I didn't want to take over the world. I didn't want to distribute. But I knew that this is an industry that needs more leaders that are going to take it upon themselves to build a better workplace for brewers and brewers are becoming more valuable and people are seeing the value in education and making sure you get someone who knows what they're doing versus just wanting to be back there and so I wanted to have that surround me yeah. you know I wanted to be that and I was lucky that I have my wonderful husband who could take part of kind of putting together like getting taking care of the money side of things making sure I'm you know we're profitable making sure I'm not overspending and you need someone who can balance what you can't do you know my specialty is the brewing and running the place and so I was lucky where I had someone who not only could I quit my job and they would help me do this but you know they were smart on <laughs> yeah. the side that I was not smart on yeah so I mean really just wanting to have a, a better way of life for myself yeah. and and just focus on my my education my growing as a brewer and, and learning and not being so wiped out at the end of the day that you don't even care about re learning the next thing, you know? Yeah. You know? Yeah. And you talked a little bit about, um, you know, that it was a thought process from a few years ago. Can you talk a little bit about how it went from a thought process a few years ago to sure. almost getting ready to open? Yeah. So <laughs> my husband was not on board. <laughs> he wasn't even my husband at the other day. He was my boyfriend. <laughs> So, you know, I come home and I'm like, we're going to open a brewery. And he's like, that's fantastic. You have fun doing that. I'm like, no, 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 <laughs> really. And then, of course, I, I can see it so clearly in my head, you know, and you have to just put that into words for people to understand. And I just knew it would be fine. I, just, I would just go home and I'd just start getting all the numbers together, putting everything together, what we need, you know, how much money we can make. And then when I like put, showed him the numbers, he became more on board. And then he um, did start taking more of like, things started, started to grow. He realized like, oh, I really do. Like he started to brew and we, we did get a home brew system and, and start brewing at home. And then he's like, oh, I actually really like this. And then, so it's ultimately has become his dream too. But at first it was not, it was very much my dream. And it's like, we probably should get married and you know, we're really gonna do this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I probably spent, you know, six months just coming home every day, just making sure I really good thoughts on paper because that's what you need to get it across to other people. And then we got some financial help, not like financial help, well, we did get financial aid help, but we got some help in putting together those financials and like how, you know, what we should be doing because it's not, doesn't, it's not that easy. You know, yeah. you have a lot of ways to keep track money, but, and, and, and spend it and use it but it's more than that it's all the taxes and all the all the laws and having people on your side so it took a while to feel comfortable of like can we do this 
It was like, yeah, we can do this. If we had the money, we could do this. So, and you know, learning, be, working at the other big breweries helped a lot in knowing what we needed to do and we didn't, how to not waste time and money. But yeah, for about six months, you're just talking about it on paper and then slowly just things kind of happen. You just kept doing it. You so we just started seeking out funding and we got a bunch of funding from his friends who are all pilots. Everyone's a pilot except for me. <laughs> And they're super excited and so we we did get some we got lucky in the sense that we have our friends to help us and uh then we're like okay we got money so we started looking for a building it was the first building this is the building the first one we looked at the first one we started talking to people too we looked at maybe like 10 but i mean we just kind of knew the location was great and if we could make it work money wise and it'd be Great. So, you know, year negotiation with the building, it would, things take a lot longer than, than, I mean, everyone says it, it takes a long yeah. time and it does. Can you describe yeah. the neighborhood we're in? Yeah. The Plaza, Plaza Midwood. Yeah, sure. So Plaza Midwood, it, I, I kind of described Charlotte as a city and little pocket neighborhoods outside the city and Plaza Midwood is kind of one of those in artsy and um it's got a great walking area of bars and restaurants and neighborhoods and um really up and coming in the sense of development and the type of businesses that are coming in like breweries you know resident culture and legion right down the street and um bottle shops we have hop shop right over there which is they play movies and different unique type of businesses there's a cup, cupcake store over there but just tons of uh not only tighten it and where, where everything is and how close you can get but like lots of events uh neighborhood there's an association called the plaza Midwood association and they really do take part in like closing down the streets and having festivals and doing you know fundraiser for this and that and keeping kind of things happen all year um and then you have like Noda brewery right over there and even south end they're all big beer pockets i mean lots of breweries, even Catawba's like right down the road, they're technically Plaza Midwood, so you could have a four little brewery tour hopping day, pretty, you know, walking distance, yeah. really. Yeah, and y'all are right next door to an apartment complex, too. Yep, um, it's actually the same owners, the, the apartment building and, and the where our building, commercial building is, and um, everyone's been super excited for us to open. Uh, like Rael told you earlier, we did a private tasting for the residents, and um, really good feedback. We'll do special things for them. We'll do birthday beers for them. So if it's their birthday, you can show me something with your name and address, prove it a little bit. <laughs> we'll give you a free beer or a flight, you know, just something to make them feel special and including them in our friends and family discount. But I mean, this is, these are our people. We don't distribute, we don't put our bottle in cans and that doesn't go anywhere except our brewery. We don't even do beer to go. So we rely on our neighbors on, to enjoy our beer so they will come and, and continue to drink it. Yeah. And, and we are very, very excited and for them and they are excited for us. I don't think there'll any fail on them being there. Hopefully they just don't drink it all. <laughs> yeah. And this kind of ties in with what you were just saying. So it may be the same answer, but what do you see as kind of the main mission for Pilot? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, we're all small batch, all experimental, all about having fun and education, community involvement. I mean, we, we're really just there, really just to provide a place for me to go to work and have fun. That's kind of like how it started. It's like, I need a job that I really enjoy, that I can do whatever I wanted. <laughs> but it, it's more than that. We really want to um, promote the education of beer. We have lots of experiments lined up, as I like to call them, where where we let all of our brewers do different yeast trials, hop trials, and present them in a way to consumers like, this is our experiment for the week. Here's a piece of paper about it with a couple beers. This is what we did, why we did it. And promoting beer education through a way that a brewery really hasn't done before, through allowing people to come back there and brew and have development and recipe creations. Every single one of our staff is a brewer everyone um we we hire bar brew tenders as we've been calling them it's about half brewer half bartender but it's so invaluable because you could you can go in there and ask them they'll, they'll be able to answer almost anything that 
that you want to know about our process, about the brewing, the beers, what we do, what what's going on, like re what's really going on with the yeast. Um, you just really lack that a lot of times when you go, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've gone to a brewery, they can't even tell me the size of the system. And I'm like, at least know that. Like as, as a person back there as the face of the brewery. Um, but not only that, we really, we can do special things like that with our community because we're so small and it's not, I mean, it's a factory. We're still making a product, but we can, it's not like a huge dangerous place where you, you know, forklifts everywhere and stuff. But between just our approach of really all hands on deck and all small batch brewing, it really leaves opens for like lots of different things we can do. We, it, we can kind of take people's ideas and easily incorporate them. We're, to a point in a non-chaotic way, you know, we're, we also want to work, we, we will be working with local chocolatiers, coffee producers, farmers, and using all their ingredients to make beer. So I think just our knowledge that we will make sure our staff has versus the knowledge that we try to give to our consumers, it really makes us stand out. But especially everything, every time you come, you'll have something new. Yeah. 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 Um, so you touched on this a little bit already with some of the issues, but can you talk about some of the challenges that yeah. you face opening your own yeah. place? Um, you, uh, I mean, this is our first location, so everything's new for us mm -hmm. and we're learning, but we rely on a lot of our contractors, our architects, like, what should we do next? You know, and sometimes not everyone knows the right answers or sometimes you think your plumbers know exactly what they should do. and this regulator is missing, which stops this whole permit thing, which is like, like really guys, like I pay you to know, but not everyone knows. And it's the one thing I've learned is everyone's just a person and person, people make mistakes and it's all working parts of people. And so it's been like a little, I guess the project managing side of it has, um, it's not, it's more th things that could have gone way worse, but I did, let me see. I do have some actually notes on that question. Um, one of the other parts that's kind of been not my favorite is we're just kind of turning people down for jobs and a lot of people are just like um, you know they just really really it's like some people are like they get the job like there it was a job posting they saw it they are qualified and that's and like good you get a lot of like are you sure you just don't have any like part-time gig like I just want to have like a little fun you're like this is a real job like with real pay and real benefits, like, no, I'm sorry, your father-in-law can't have a fun thing to do on Saturdays. Like, come on, man. <laughs> so you, you, it's not everyone. There's lots of people who take you seriously, but there, you definitely get a little bit of, well, I just really want to, you know, get out of being a corp in the corporate world and just want to do something different. I'm like, yeah, we all do, but it, I mean, we really are looking for. Our job posting, we've got a handful of people already hired. We were looking for one person, which so we wanted that person to be one of the best. Mm -hmm. So you, we, I, I try, I feel bad because I want to be like, we do have a couple people who aren't like all brewers, but I already got them. I can't take more, you know, it's kind of hard to, people don't understand that this really is about like knowing something about brewing. And it's also about being good behind the bar. It's, you've got a lot of, boxes to check and that's at the same time I like to consider ourselves leaders in in what we pay in the industry is but for a brewery our size I mean we really are that's one of the reasons I wanted to get into this I was like if we cannot provide a couple jobs where these people have full insurance don't have to worry about living paycheck to paycheck then we're not doing something right and it's a high paying job, so we want a person who deserves that high paying job, not just someone who's looking for a paycheck. And, and we've gotten some people who, you know, I, you don't post, I guess I'm assuming most people don't post what they pay on their <laughs> job posting. But you, I've gotten some people who be like, I just cannot even send you a resume until I know the pay. And I'm like, I just don't need your resume. It's fine. <laughs> like, Why? you get a lot of, it's really, people got a lot, it's, it's very uh, interesting. <laughs> People's yeah. approaches to getting jobs. So that's been a little like, a little difficult. But then sometimes you get good people who just didn't have that brewing. Everything else is great. I'm just like, I'm sorry, I swear I'm not like 
full of myself. I just really need someone with like, because yeah. Hardywood took a chance on me. I never knew how to brew and I really wanted to do that for someone else and I did. I just can't do that for everyone, you know? Yeah. Yeah, no, that makes sense. That makes complete sense. So um, when Pilot opens, mm -hmm. will you guys have a signature beer? Do you, do you have something in mind that would be a signature or are you going to kind of we, get away see, from that? Just because we like don't like have flash chips in your exactly. House. There's nothing I'm like pushing. I'm just kind of pushing everything. Um, I can tell you some of the beers like we will open with. Yeah, we are doing a collaboration with Smelly Cat Roasting Company, the coffee place, and we're doing a chocolate milk stout with their coffee beans, and they're going to come brew it with us. You know, and um, we'll do a uh, fruited saison, a blackberry saison, kind of similar to this, just without the vanilla, like mm -hmm. and the spices, but. Um, and we'll team up with some local farmers for to get to source those fruits. Pretty much for all anything we use fruit or ginger, anything we can get local, we will. Everybody that works there will brew their own beer for the opening, and they will continue to do that throughout the whole. And I need them to because there's a lot of brewing to be done, and I can't do it all, and I don't have all the ideas. How many folks are you going to have <coughs> brewing at opening? We'll have four full-time people and one part-time. Jen Blair is right. our part-time. And she'll tell you, she's great. She'll tell you all about her. But she's fantastic. She, I'm like, I thank you <laughs> for working here. Yeah, I think we're, we're going to try to um, interview her when we come back. That lady is, um, I can't even, she's amazing. She's got so many beer titles in the industry, if you will. <laughs> so kind of thinking a few years into the future, like in five years, say, mm -hmm. how do you see Pilot kind of, developing in five years where would in in your ideal world where would you be sitting in five years um, we definitely want to grow we don't want to stop here but we don't we don't want to distribute mm -hmm. it's not i mean i i never say never but it's definitely not in our plans at the moment we do want to expand in the sense of maybe opening a second facility with a bigger um, brew system still with the same concept of brew tending we or if not, at least in a position where they are making a good amount of money. Yeah, that's, that's the goal, is make sure everyone still makes good money. But um, our second location, we've talked about probably adding a restaurant side to it and making big enough to support clean beer for this location, turning this location into a sour facility um, and support beer for maybe a third satellite location that doesn't have a brewing system so maybe something like in the airport yeah or you know but that's kind of that's our three to five year goal yeah and you will never see we'll know we don't know exactly what will happen but we do know that we want to at least have a second facility that's bigger because first location is needed to open second second location is needed to expand first location like hour wise beer to go wise you know so um there's definitely expand and then you know just maybe it's hard to tell the future maybe maybe we stop there maybe we do um smaller nano breweries throughout and i see that as really being our direction it, because that's the best way to keep it small and, or small batch and and really worry about the quality because we really want to grow through the quality of our beer not the quantity it's very important. So you just have a little, it's just important that it's good and that everyone knows what they're talking about. Right. Like that works there, you know. Right. Um, so as you've kind of been going through the process of opening your brewery or even, to be honest, developing it as a brewer, are there certain resources that you've really kind of leaned on or drawn from in the process? Yeah. Well, um, just throughout my whole career, you know, Brewers Association has been good for not only educational things, but... Uh, for opening a brewery wise giving you statistics and information and um, keeping track of you know uh, market research information for you um, let's see uh, Cicerone has been a great program um, Cicerone is a business that someone with beer knowledge started but it's uh, I, do you know too much about have you heard a little of bit but go ahead and sure. talk a little bit about it so it's a, a program started by a guy named ray daniels who was working for the brewers association a long time ago and I, he left to start cicero and it was basically a certification program that says you know a lot about beer um kind of similar to being a sommelier of mm -hmm. wine and and i'm sure they have their program too but um 
Hardywood was big on us becoming sister and certified. Um, you know, as a lot of businesses who focus in beer might want their staff to be, it shows that you have a basic yeah. display of beer knowledge. And if I go into a bar and they were all sister and certified, I would have total confidence in everything that they were doing. I wouldn't worry about it. Um, that's fairly rare to find, but beer server is kind of the first level of that. It's an online test. And I still, you go into bars, you, you say, oh, everyone here is beer server certified. I'm like, that's cool, because that's not, um, that's something that a lot of people take upon themselves. Like, oh, I want to expand my beer education. Um, I'm going to start this Cicerone. Beer servers, you have to do level one in order to take level two. Mm -hmm. And there's four levels. Um, the third is called advanced Cicerone. The fourth is called master. There's like 20 people, maybe less, who are master Cicerone. It's also very expensive to take the test. It's not, you know, if, if it was cheap or free, I'm sure more people would be. Um, Jen and I are taking our advanced Cicerone this fall. Um, Hardywood became a uh, certified Cicerone. So through that, because of that program, I was forced to study for this big test, which then you, as through the years, I'm like, okay, well, I kind of, I will. I want it that advanced, the third level is new. It used to just go from the second to, so it'd be like a $400 test to a $1,000 test, you know, and to, it, it takes like two days of testing and you, you have to go to Chicago and you have to sit in front of Ray and you're just like, I don't need to do that. But, you know, you find the value of these things. So because of that program in particular, everyone is beer server certified. We will pay every, for everyone to go get their certification. Um, so I th think because of that road, I had to go to town. To, you know, I learned a lot about beer. I, I was studied a lot. And then just being in the around it all the time. Yeah. You really have an advantage, more so than you probably even care to want to have. But, I mean, you, you've, it's your job. So you, what becomes so second nature to you is something a home brewer might just be learning for the first time. And you forget how much of an advantage you have. Um, just kind of working and being around beer in general, being around beer people who can just kind of talk the lingo with you back and forth. But it's different organizations that, you know, Pink Boots Society has been one that promotes that. You, you get to go hang out with a bunch of people who know about beer, you know. So you, all these different networking really does help you learn, oh, this class is going on. I'm going to go check this class out. And uh, we take advantage of the classes of, like, White Labs. Uh, we just went to a yeast class last week, and all of that information is so valuable. If you can just bring this much and apply it to your brewery, um, it really had all those things can give you different little heads up, you know. But you got to be willing to uh, learn and accept, sort through that information. You can get some bad information sometimes, yeah. you know. I've, we've met one of the challenges. We, we've met people that would try to tell us we really needed them to help the, uh, so the, for them to help us like like finally for TTB you know if, for example we had a couple of lawyers being like you can't do it on your own which is filling out paperwork I'm pretty sure we can and, and it's so easy you can I mean TTB helps you do it they even have like a presentation for like dummies on like how to really it's so you have to be careful about who who who's good help and, and who's not. But for the most part, I would say, any organization that you can get information from, like probrewer.com, the American um, Home Brewers Association, Master Brewers of America, G Brewers Association, they're all been, yeah. you, you know, you take a, there's a lot of information. So you take a glance at all and you pick through it. Yeah. But there's nothing more valuable than working at a brewery. Right. Just being there. I mean, just learning the dangers of it. I mean, I mean there's, there's a lot that people don't know, you know. Don't sand under the CO2. You know? <laughs> but it's a good rule of thumb. It's a good rule. Yeah. You, think, you don't think you have to teach people that, but you don't, never know. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, have, do you have any specific people who maybe you consider a mentor in the process? Yeah. Um, I definitely consider... Uh, a guy named Patrick Murtaugh, he was the, one of the owners of Hardywood. I mean, he taught me a lot about brewing. He, he really he gave me the um, freedom, if you will, to go and brew and make mistakes and learn. And, um, 
you know, he's, he's made my time at Hardywood educational and that was kind of really awesome for me because I, it was like the first job I had had that I started learning again, you know, I'd worked at lots of beer bars and that's great giving me some information, but I got to learn something new. So that was a big deal. I would say before that, when I first started getting into beer, when I was very young at Capitol Oil House, there was one of our managers named Jacob. He was the beer buyer for that, the location I worked for. I mean, and I feel like I learned everything I knew about beer for up to a couple years from him. And I, and I did, I mean, he taught the beer classes and that, and I, I mean, I really learned not only like about beer, but about draft systems and, and kegs and like the, some of the dangers that you face working behind a bar, which you don't learn all that stuff working in a brewery necessarily. Um, and for education or, you know, tests like Cicerone, where it's really all about everything that was super helpful. So he provided me this really good base of knowledge that gave me a step up in the brewing world, I think. Um, and that, you know, those two are, are definitely the ones that come to mind. I, I would say there's a brewer named Megan Parisi, who I've always looked up to a lot. And I've done a, a couple beers with her in collaborations. She is now the head brewer for Sam Adams at their research and development brewery in, in Boston. And she's, she's just great and so smart, very smart. And um, I'm super honored when, that she even brewed with me, you know, when, when we did do beers together. And we do, we have talked about hopefully doing a pilot Sam Adams collaboration together. I mean, within ourselves, you know, it's nothing too serious, but I would very much like to do that. I'd be and, cool. uh, I think she just needs to get the okay, but it seems like they let her do whatever she wants. So we'll see. <laughs> very cool. That would be cool. So how long, how long have you been here in Charlotte? I've been here for probably about three years now. And so even within those three years, there's been a lot of changes oh, yeah, to the beer sure. scene here in Charlotte. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I, definitely the expansions of, of breweries or openings of breweries and, and expansions of breweries um, you know, from small nano breweries like Free Range to, you know, big Noda's 60 barrel expansion. Um, I'd say with that has come some more education. People have moved here from other places, you know, like myself, brought some education and um, more, I've definitely seen a change in the quality of like lab work, if you will, like more breweries paying attention to the amount of DO in their finished product, which is very important. I mean, it, coming from Colorado where they have a 30 year old beer history, you know, versus here, where it's about seven. It's uh, nice to see the little bit more care being taken in the beer, definitely between now and like three years ago, yeah. with like tasting panels happening and um, sending beers off to get lab work actually like tested. And just when you're so small and not everyone, you don't make room for that. You don't build as you don't, you don't know to necessarily think about that. Um, because when you're home brewing, you don't do a lot of that stuff, but it doesn't scale up that way. You know, you have to, so that's been kind of nice because, you know, I'm, I'm, I mean, when I first moved here, I was not impressed. I, I knew, I knew Noda. I knew he, they were the only brewery I knew of as a brewer outside of North Carolina because they had won gold at World Beer Cup for their like IPA, which is a big deal because a lot of some people brew IPAs. So I was like, I want to work there. They are the only brewery I wanted to work for. I would probably have commuted to Foothills or something. I was, I knew that I was good and I wanted to work for a good brewery. And I didn't know of any other good breweries besides Noda. And when I got here, it was just a lot of okay beer. Some even infected beer. It was hard to find like a super, super great brewery. Um, I don't think that, I think there are a lot more breweries that have opened up since then, but that are doing great. I love Free Range. I love Wooden Robot. I think they're doing a great job. But uh, I could tell, and I was like, there's just a lot of okay beer here. And um, so it's nice to see the, ch the change of trying to better it versus just getting the small equipment, just starting there, you know? And, we're, and they are, and they're doing it. And Victory Southern Tier is opening now, and they have offered use to their lab. So if you wanna, you know, come check something out underneath their microscope, you can, or you know, whatever tool you might want to use, which is really yeah, nice. And, that is. and that is what they should be doing. That's what it's about, you know, and hopefully people take advantage of it. I know I will. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so 
thinking forward for the industry as a whole, where do you see the brewing industry going in I think, five or ten years? I think it's going. I think the the large breweries and the really small nano breweries are going to be fine. I think the mid scale breweries, like Left Hand, they're a mid sized brewery. I think they'll have a hard time. Um, nano small batch is it, definitely the thing to open right now. Mark shelf space is is dwindling and it's not even the best for your product. I can't tell you how many times I play the date game on cans and bottles and I don't want an old IPA. And if you don't have the date on there, I'm not even getting it. Or if you have a Best Buy date, don't make that decision for me. <laughs> like I'm not getting it. So you, people got to get a hold on that. Like breweries need to get a hold on that because it is a big deal. And if if you if you give your beer to a total wine and they have 500 beers, a half of your beer sits back there for months and, and that for me it's frustrating to go and and have to find to go find a six pack is frustrating like a good one so I rather go to the fresh right to the source right where it's brewed and just the same reasons why you know mom and pop restaurants are more popular than your Applebee's it's just it's fresher it's right there it's at the source you can see it being made you can you know people identify with local I think that is the smart step for brewing, if you want to open a brewery, mm -hmm. um, you retain a lot more money when you just put beer in the glass and serve it at the bar versus putting it in the can and having a driver and getting a truck or signing with the distributor, whatever you want to do. It's just it, financially, it's hard. And if you, unless you're opening a huge, huge, huge facility, it's going to be hard to make money. I mean, so it, like, you know, even OMB and NOTA, I mean, they're. They're big. How how <laughs> history will show you can only self distribute up to a certain amount of beer. And you know, Left Hand opened up as a self distributing company, and once they even bought out a whole another brewery called Tabernash to try to sustain that, and they couldn't. And once you got up to about twenty thousand, twenty five thousand barrels a year, you really can't sustain that. So you're gonna see, especially with all the self distribution going on in North Carolina, it will be interesting to see how they grow and I think how they grow will be multiple locations. I don't think they'll buy the 500 barrel fermenters because ooh, they might, but they're going to have, you know, 10 pubs, 10 tap rooms because they got to put their beer somewhere Yeah, and you can only self distribute so much. Or sometimes you see them sign with distributors in other states or for just their bottles, which have been things that you clearly see the need for a distributor, but you're, people are fighting it. So it, it's interesting to see how the, you know, some people, it, it, I, so I, I consider myself growing up in Virginia brewing, brewer wise, where you have to sign with a distributor. So to me, it was very much, uh, that's what you did. And um, everyone had a great relationship up there with each other. So it wasn't like a nasty thing, if you yeah. will. But um, just to see how they're gonna come to terms with that decision. You know, Foothills kind of got that big and they were like, we can't um, keep all this staff. We have to sign with the distributor. It, it sucks. Some people got let go. Some people got put in the brewery or, or quit, you know, and people will have to make that decision if they continue to grow. I mean, you can't buy these huge facilities and then not make enough beer. So, right. We'll see. I mean, that's, I really think the way what I'm doing is not only the easiest, the most fun, the most affordable, the most manageable. I, it really it seems like a no-brainer to me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. Well, you mentioned, I mean, one of the things you mentioned is that you guys are going to have lots of rotating styles. Yeah. Are there particular styles that you, or trends, beer trends, that you really are oh, yeah. liking or even disliking today? Yeah. Um, so something I've, I've been uh, kind of researching more and think it's really cool. Some breweries, especially in Europe, have been fermenting under pressure. A really low amount of pressure um, high amount of pressure would stress out that yeast too much but, but um, we had, were kind of into that and looking at some different lager type yeast uh, white labs has a type of lager yeast that you can ferment under pressure and it will finish in seven days yeah so <laughs> I, I don't know it's uh, the first time we at the class they told us about that it's the first time I heard heard about it but I because I had asked about you know all this for especially in Germany. We were over in Germany this past fall and there was a lot of fermenting under pressure. And she's like, yeah, it just speeds up your fermentation, which makes sense as to why they would do that with lagers. 
and um and then she told us about this yeast that they had so we've that is like really interesting and we're going to do a lot of fermenting under pressure kind of experience experience experiments so we can bust out some lagers in the quick term because that is it takes a long time to brew way longer than an ale and when we're putting out beers like that we need it to brew faster um so ways to make brewing faster is always yeah. <laughs> fun but uh there's some things that i really have not like i mean i'm not a new england ipa style uh i i think it comes from being a brewer for a while i was you know learned to, how to make clean beer that was or clear beer that was you know, very hop forward still and to retain all the aroma without having to make milkshakes i can't understand it i can understand trying new things and experiments but at the end of the day are you just making a hoppy wheat beer are you just not crashing skipping vorloff adding flour all things i've heard being done you know it does it doesn't even taste good to me. It just it's just a bunch of flavor in your mouth that's gritty. I, everyone's I've had some taste some stuff that tastes good. It's just it's just a fad to me that I don't. You know, I, I, it's funny because I feel like the owner of Hardywood when we first started because he felt this way about black IPAs, and he's like, just brew a hoppy Schwartz beer, and I feel <laughs> myself sounding like that, and I get it now. So I'm like, why? What's wrong with black up here? It's stupid. <laughs> stupid. That's totally the way I feel about New England IPA. It's just no point. No point. But yeah. you know, that's the beauty about being an American brewer. There's no in hocks about it. You can do what you want. Doesn't mean you should. Um, I've heard of a brewery transferring their beer through jeans before. Apparently it was on the hot side. I don't care. I still don't. Just because you should doesn't mean you you're just because you can doesn't mean you should. So I'm not a fan of the glitter fears that have been going around. I, I you know, I think it's cool looking and it gets everyone excited and, and it doesn't really bother me, but as a, uh, like on the process side, it really bothers me. I'm scared of what's happening in my keg. Like, I, can I get all that glitter out? I don't know. Glitter likes to stay around for years. So that was a big uh, TVT zone for me, but, um, those are the only things that really get me fired up. Yeah. 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 I've never thought about the cleaning portion of the glitter beer. Yeah. I was like, if you could just take it's the glass. It's impossible to clean out of anything. If you can just do it in the glass, that's fine. But other than that, I don't want, that's weird to me. Um, I, I'd rather have a glitter beer than a New England IPA though. <laughs> Apparently it'll make your uh, poop a little shiny also, the, the glitter. There you go. That's what I've heard. I, d I haven't tried, <laughs> but I would try. I would see. Oh. We're all about experimenting, right? Yeah, there you go. Well, you know, Pilot's going to open and you're going to have, you know, owner and head brewer as a woman, at least one of your part-time brewers and one of your full-time brewers, women. Yep. Um, you know, craft brewing is stereotypically categorized as a male-dominated field. Yeah. Um, are there specific challenges that you feel you've faced as a woman brewer <laughs> and brewery owner? I would say from coworkers across the board, no, not really. I've mm -hmm. always had really awesome coworkers. Um, you'll get people that walk in the brewery who think they're someone and totally look. You know, I don't. I don't know anything. There's no possible way I could know anything. You get some of that, and uh, it's always kind of since I started this brewery, or started at least working in there, it's happened a couple of times, so you, 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 you've you learned to just kind of, I don't know, it doesn't really bother me, because I just know that it doesn't matter, because at the end of the day, this is my brewery and my beer, but, you know, there's some of the, I say specifically just having to not necessarily defend myself as a woman, maybe I have to like speak up a little bit more, say, hey, I'm here, but just really proving myself as a brewer because you go in there and, and it's all about hard work. And I have noticed on the flip side, every female brewer I have ever met has their shit together. Like they know what they're talking about. They know what they're doing. They understand like they can, the physical part, it's not like, oh, I can't do that. It's like, no, this is how you do it. They're confident in their skills 
And I, I, there's not, lots of male brewers I've met, coworkers who are who I've trained who are not. And um, there, there is a difference there. I've never met a female brewer who didn't know what they were talking about, you know, um, professionally at least. And um, so, for the most part, no. Sometimes yes. Sometimes you just, but so, if you no know more than you wouldn't get out in the public. Everyone has the type of guys they run into who question you just because you are a female. And I think it just kind of stems from being that type of person already. Yeah. You know, just kind of bring carrying that over into the workplace yeah. more so. Um, I've had people that, whether I, it's because I'm a female or not, but I've definitely had a, you know, one time I made a mistake at a brewery and it was bad. It was fixable, but it was a mistake. And that's what happens. People make mistakes. And I kid you not, the next week, a, a guy made the mistake, the same mistake. And he was promoted the week after, and I was on probation. So it's like, you, there's some, been some times you're just like, come on, seriously, is this because I'm a girl? One time a guy who uh, work, was my equal, I considered myself higher than him in the company and my knowledge, and the, I've been there longer and all sorts of things. And he made one quarter more than me per hour. Now, <laughs> you know, I didn't find that out until like, after I worked there, but it's kind of like, never in my life have I felt like I actually experienced being paid less because of being a woman until now. Never in my life. Worked there not as long as me, did not know as much, didn't have any sort of, it was his first brewing job. Oh. It's like, I don't know where that came from or how long, you know, but it's like, that's a little... That stuck out. Yeah. That stuck out. Yeah. You know, I, and, and of course, just having the feeling of, I really do think if I had, you know, decided to have a child at the last brewery I worked at, I probably would have had to uh, find a different job. I don't think there would have been a spot for me. And North Carolina can do that. It's yep. very much there. And I get it. You can't do your job. You need someone who can do the job. I mean, I understand, but not saying that would have happened i don't know for sure but it was my feeling it's it's something you think about when yeah. you're a woman it just is and yeah so not too much I, I have not experienced any like sexual harassment personally um i know other people have but i've been lucky i also think they know i'd probably d knock them out <laughs> but people have i've been lucky in the sense that i have i've had some shit bosses I've definitely worked for people who did not know what they were talking about, and I was smarter than them, and that's frustrating no matter who you are. But I'd say a little bit, but at the, at the, at the end of the day, I am a good brewer, and I make good beer, and I know that, and I'm confident. I don't know everything, but I'll be the first to admit and to tell you when I don't know something. And, and I can accept criticism, and that a lot of people cannot, especially a lot of brewery owners, so I think... <clears throat> and then the day people have their thoughts it doesn't really always bother me sometimes it does but yeah no yeah we well, talked a couple of minutes ago you mentioned pink boots mm -hmm. um can you talk a bit about kind of a group like pink boots and how it can yeah so pink boots is a nonprofit organization for any woman who earns their income from beer in any aspect of the industry um they provide scholarships and grants towards women um, for different uh, brewing programs, maybe at a brewery or at a school like Siebel or stuff like that. Uh, they're not super huge. They are growing. They are global. They are international, and they do have groups in other countries. Um, but they are just a good networking source. They get together and have monthly meetings. It's, it's been growing more in the uh, in Charlotte, North Carolina, where uh, the females who really just kind of work the jobs around here have been taken upon themselves to start chapters and, and have meetings here. Before Charlotte, my exposure were yearly meetings at GABF or CBC or something like that, in, in which they would have a presentation and someone else who was influential, a female influential, would come and speak like, um, uh, the uh, owner, Russian River, the wife of you know, uh, Vinny, she came down. And it was like cool. Like Carol Stout came and spoke one time. That was super cool. So it's just meet some pioneers and women. It's been kind of a good uh, source for that. 
they are, like and I said they've recently been doing more in North Carolina and they'll get together have an education seminar seminar and and it's really a lot about networking uh, I always recommend it to someone if they want to get into the industry or um, into brewing maybe more specifically if they have like a beer bartending job to like check it out and, and to get into it it's like I said it's growing and it's it's really what the group makes of it you know whoever took it upon themselves to start a chapter which is a lot of work and I've thought about it when I was in Richmond but I ultimately decided I didn't have the time and um, it's just it's just a good educational networking group really it's a chance for women to get together once a month and you know a lot of people feel uncomfortable when they're with a bunch of males to talk about maybe issues that affect them and that allows them to have that resource or I mean it's great if I hey, I'll post jobs to people you know the, like they'll know if we have a job opening or if any brewery does and you know that a lot of those people do work at breweries so they'll have good connections maybe through there yeah. get to know someone and it's just a nice little um, way little nonprofit organization that could help a couple women like, you know they, I'm sure they could do scholarships for everyone they would but you know you can apply for them and get and that's really cool if the, a couple people have been sent you know to other countries to do a program and yeah that's nice and we've done stuff to sponsor it in the past like uh, we do a breast cancer beer every, mostly everybody does a breast cancer beer and, or I'm sorry, not breast cancer. Yes, that's true, but most everyone does the International Women's Brew Day and donates the proceeds to Pink Boots, a lot of people, and, or, or just have festivals just to donate. So it's a good organization. Uh, it's just really small. Yeah. And you know, it's ran by volunteers. Like maybe one or two people actually work for it, but, so yeah. it's just a good networking organization for, for women. and. You do have to be, I guess you really can't join it unless you're already making some uh, money, but you can still go to the <laughs> meetings. It's not like they're like, no, you can't be here. It's not like that. It's like to, to pay them your dues, you know? <laughs> like to give them money, you have to be making money from beer, but you can still go to it. Like if you were like in a corporate role and you just homebrewed and wanted to get into it, I mean, yeah. it wouldn't turn you away. Yeah. <laughs> So if, if you did have like a young woman who's looking to enter the field come up to you and ask for advice, what words of wisdom would you give well, her? I would say apply. Like it really does start there. <laughs> You'd be surprised no one ever applies. And I get it, you might not feel you're like you're qualified or whatever. And not everyone is putting out jobs all the time that you are qualified for, but you can get into the bar side or human resources side or a bigger brewery, just applying. Um, of course, don't take a job you don't want, but other than that, go join a homebrew club or, or just start going to the local homebrew meetings um, and meet someone with the brew system and start brewing, even if it's at their place. Um, anything, or, or you know, getting a job at a beer bar, anything that you can do to expose yourself to beer is obviously going to benefit you. Um, and it's it's easy to go to uh, uh, Charlotte Beer Babes, for example, is a local just group of women who don't necessarily have beer jobs. They just really like brewing and, and they just meet up monthly at different breweries and have tours. And uh, we just, once a year at NOTA, they do a, a ladies brew day. And we just did that with them where some of the professional brewers or people with equipment will come and be mentor teams and they do a DME brew hmm. and Noda's kind enough to like let us use their water and space and stuff like that. Um, Charlotte Beer Breaks is a great way to just meet people who are into beer and um, then you ultimately meet people who are brewing and you'll get to, you know, but if you can start brewing, start reading and just start applying. I mean, it depends on what your other skills are. I, would, I had a lot of bartending experience, I had a lot of beer buyer experience. I just, I was really like, I, could, I was physically able to work, like pick up the kegs and bags and stuff. And it, yes, that's what I did is I swept floors and bucked out mash tons and it's not fun. <laughs> it's not, get on the floor, you can get dirty. And, but you know, the, at the end of the day, the reward of brewing your own beer, that's fun. You just gotta be willing to make no money and take a crap job. 
<laughs> almost is like the way to put it. And I, I, I say that, and they're not all, they're not crap jobs. They're great jobs, and bartending at a brewery is a great way to get in, to, just to get your foot in the door. I mean, there's so many entry, bottling, working the keg cleaning, doing the entry level jobs. If you're willing to go and do that, I mean, that's how you get in. But yeah. you know, at the end of the day, it's hard work, it, no matter what position. And if that's not your thing, but maybe sales is, and there's a ton of rep and sales jobs. And those people are saints. I would never want to be a sales <laughs> rep. Oh my God. I did it for a little bit at Hardywood and oh, it was my least favorite. But just. <laughs> And that's what I did was talk to people all up until that point, you know, about beer, but just the travel and the, oh God. So, I mean, it's not, it depends on what you want to do. Brewing, uh, it's almost easier if you can just start brewing with other people and learning because you can read all day about it, but it doesn't matter until you yeah. start putting your hands on it. I mean, I did not truly understand it until... I was doing it. And even then I didn't understand what was going on. I just knew what to do. You know, I just knew that I needed to get the clear wort from the grain. I didn't know that the first part of the clear wort had most of the sugars and the last part had, you know, it's, it's, it's like learning another language too. You're never going to stop learning. There's always, you, you are never finished learning about beer, even the most skilled people out there. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So what's, what would you say is your favorite part about working in the industry here? In Charlotte specifically? Mm -hmm. Or even North Carolina if you want yeah. to be a little broader. Well, it's very similar to Richmond in that everyone's kind of tight knit. You know, everyone, everyone kind of hangs out and brewer wise, you know, beer wise and, and helps each other. And Colorado is very, like everyone's a brewer in Colorado. Like seriously, everyone. <laughs> There's so many brewers everywhere and breweries, which is great just so big it's just so much it didn't feel like that tight knit i really do appreciate that ab about here also the fact that it's so new still it is it's still so baby here it really is i mean even cask beer for a thing is such a small amount of beer that's served here and such a big part of my beer life in virginia so being able to kind of like we're going to do it every friday we're going to have randall's all the time nitro beer just kind of like, that's my favorite thing. It's like, it's still so baby. There's so much more room for education and growth They like to start doing all those things that hopefully it's like some of the other breweries will start doing too. If it yeah. catches on, you know, cast beer for an example. And some people do, it's just like how small, how much more room for growth there is. And um, just how like, close everything is too it's kind of fun especially with these scooters i don't know if you've seen those around here yeah they're fun i can ride them from my house to work and we've ridden them to noda to the other breweries and just go brewery hopping um and and, and then you get all your friends are are all at the breweries so, and it's just a lot more fun it wasn't like that in colorado colorado is still great i mean you go snowboarding before you go to work it's very different lifestyle but it's just like the the tight knit community yeah very similar to Richmond um, and then I can kind of I can still drive to Richmond which is great because it's close and I like yeah. the beer there a lot too but I love um, I love being near Asheville that's one of my favorite things about being here and White Labs is right up there you still got a bunch of big breweries that are up there which are all fun to visit but uh, the beer scene is really great in Asheville really great in Raleigh and Durham too lots of, lots of great beer towns and I, I do think we are behind all them in a beer sense. I think, I think everyone is making great beer everywhere. I, there's, there's, everywhere has good beer, everywhere has some bad beer. It's not about them, but they're just a little bit more older in the market, a little bit more um, built out, if you will. There's a lot of small nano breweries and it never runs out. And yeah. if you can see, they're still opening all the time. Everyone's gonna be fine. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so this is a question that most people always laugh and say is the hardest question we ask. Yeah. So what's your, your favorite, favorite beer, beer <laughs> from a brewer, North Carolina brewery other than your own? I would say Free Range. Free Range, um, they make a sourdough IPA that I've just fallen in love with because they take sourdough yeast from a local bread maker from their like 200 year old sourdough starter. And this guy props up yeast for it and they just throw it in the beer. And I think it's genius because it won't do anything to your brewery, like it won't funk it up or anything. And it gives you a slight little tartness, like like sourdough bread, 
but it's beer and I love it. I think it's just wow. delicious. I can drink it like water and sometimes they make it a Saison style. Sometimes they make IPA and I can't wait to do it. I told them I was stealing that idea, but <laughs> I was doing it. They are great guys. They really are. They are uh, really similar. We, we based our model off of what they were doing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that is, I would say them, they are my favorite brewery you know, yeah. in North Carolina. So what about your own stuff that you've brewed? What, do you have a favorite? Well, my, my favorite styles to drink are like dry IPAs um, that are crisp, not like multi background ones, and that I've just like show, showcased the hop. Um, I wouldn't say like I necessarily have a favorite to brew. I definitely have styles that I like to drink more, but I, I, I can't, it's such, I just love to drink it all. Now, my go-to style is IPA, if it's fresh. <coughs> That's the other part, but you know, if you go to a brewery, it's fine. But uh, <clears throat> I really just, it's so hard to answer, to say it, you know, like a signature beer too, we just, I think I, we really just are so unique in the fact that everything's so different all the time. Yeah. And I definitely have my, you know, I, my favorite at the end of the day, don't want to think about anything beer is grab an IPA <laughs> for sure. And something that's not too high in alcohol because session beers are, they're good. I don't care what people say. Low alcohol is good. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know how much free time you actually even have these yeah. days. <laughs> but when you're not brewing or working on the brewery, what are some of the things that you do in your free time? Sure. Um, well, we love to travel. It's really hard to really go anywhere recently, but um, if we can, even just like a day trip travel, um, anywhere we can take our dog. It's always kind of fun because I feel so feel so bad for her lately. She's just been at daycare a lot. I feel, I mean, we... We'll take her to work eventually, but we're still in the construction. Uh, but I, I mean, going to other breweries, just busy, hanging out breweries and as corny as it sounds, I've been studying a lot, you know, it's tests coming up and stuff, but God, free time is, has been hard. It has been, you know, a lot of the times when we're not at the brewery, it's because we're at an event or something else that has, you know, which is all fun. It is, but it's all work at the same time. Yeah. And, but you know, just you know, learning about other breweries and taking like little mini field trips to visit other breweries is always helpful in what we want to do and, and determining what we want to do, you know, yeah, or what we don't want to do. <laughs> That's helpful too. Yeah. Um, well, do you have anything else that we haven't talked about that you wanted to add? Anything uh, we've skipped over? I'm sure we'll all think of it later. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it goes, right? It, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, I don't. Anything, nothing else top of my mind. Awesome. Well, thank yeah. you so much yeah. for sitting down no, with us. Thank we you really guys. appreciate it.